Hi, I'm Rob Yagner from LazyGate Studios, and I want to talk a little today about innovation. So I'm working on a game project right now called Extrasolar. And Extrasolar on its surface looks like a legitimate scientific expedition. You can get a rover, you use rovers to take photos on the surface of a planet, and so as a user, you are helping the scientists explore this planet one photo at a time. I've given this pitch to dozens of audiences, and the most common question that I get is, how do the rovers kill each other? Which seems absolutely crazy to me, but I think we need to talk about where these questions come from. Uh, we all have assumptions about what a game is and what a game is supposed to be, and these assumptions are built, like, built up over decades of playing and making games. But these assumptions can also sometimes box us in and constrain our thinking. What we need to remember is that we were the ones who created this box. And as a result, if we want to, we can grow the box, reshape it, think outside it, or destroy it. And in fact, some might even claim that this is our responsibility. So I don't want to say that innovation isn't happening in game development today. There's definitely innovation, but, but where is this happening? I mean, certainly there's innovation in monetization. When you rock, walk around the halls and, and lectures at GDC, you'll see all kinds of talks about microtransactions, and free-to-play, embedded ads, paper play, subscription, product placement, even psychological tactics for getting payers to play, which tend to be really super effective. Uh, there's innovation in promotion and visibility. I mean, this is a, a quote from a company, I, I won't say who, but they say they promote iPhone and iPad applications to put them in the top 25 in three days. Now, as you might imagine, to do that, you use ClickBot farms and paper installs and click exchanges, and the quality is no longer necessary. If you have twenty or $30,000 to spare, you can get your ad in the top of the iTunes store. Uh, and as a result, I mean, this is no longer a level playing field. So, so what is this, the, the strategy, the resulting strategy for the big companies? Well, let the indies innovate, clone what works, because game mechanics are not copyrightable. Pay money to outpromote the competitors. It's simple and effective, and it works every time. So this leaves indies in a catch-22. You innovate, and you get cloned. You fail to innovate, and you get ignored. So what is an indie developer to do? Well, a couple solutions. One, you can innovate in form. Things like aesthetic, story, audio, and characters are protected by copyright law. And not only that, but this kind of polish is very hard to, in, to, to, uh, to emulate. So if you can get that polish in those areas, it'll really help establish a brand. The other thing is to go nuts. I love this quote from uh, computing pioneer Howard Aiken, who worked on the Harvard Mark II computer. He said, don't worry about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. When you really innovate in a lot of ways, what you do is risky. And... Uh, the, you know, the big studios aren't going to come in and copy you because they're scared to. So, okay, I'm telling you, you need to innovate, but uh, how are we supposed to do this? I mean, that's sort of easier said than done. A couple strategies. The first one, and this is going to sound crazy, but I'm going to say it anyway. To unconstrain your thinking, think with constraints. To unconstrain your thinking, think with constraints. I know this sounds weird, but I promise you it works, and if you've ever been to a game jam where they've used constraints to help the creative process, you understand that this works. So let, let's walk through a few examples of how this might happen. So let's, let's start with our assumptions about what a game is supposed to be. I mean, we, console generation after console generation, we just have more and more buttons on our controllers. And this is, there's this assumption that this complexity makes things better. So what if, you'd, what if you cross out this assumption and turn it on its head and make our constraint, let's make a game with one button. Well, what you might end up with is something like Cannibal. And in fact, Cannibal... Uh, has been hugely successful, and it's inspired a, t a ton of other great one-button games. So how about another example? How about uh, one just from physics? You know, time moves forward. Well, what happens when you when you turn this on its head and use make time move backwards as a constraint? Well, you might end up with something really cool like retrograde. Um, how about a really core assumption about video games in general, that there must be a screen? You know, what happens when you turn this on its head and say, let's make a game with no screen? Well, you might end up with something like Johann Sebastian Joust. And when you're done, what is this? You know, is this a video game? Is it a sport? Ultimately, none of that matters. What matters is that it came from us. And when we, when we as an industry create something like this, we forever change the shape of a box. We change the assumptions that we operate under, and this frees up everyone to do more inspirational work. So, so solution one was, to think, uh, to unconstrain your thinking, think with constraints. Uh, exercise two is, is be inspired. I mean, we all spend a lot of time doing this, and this is really important. It's important to keep up with what else is going on in the game industry, uh, to, to see what our other peer indies are doing, and, uh, and be inspired by them. But, but don't forget to also be inspired by this, and by this, and this. and this. Thank you for your time.